So I guess we're all assembled here to witness the glory that is Ada. Oh, <laughs> I mean, welcome. <laughs> um, well, you obviously know why you're here, because I, I don't know how many people here actually have heard of Ada. That's positive. The how women the language? The language. I'm pretty sure that's the one I meant. But <laughs> thank you for clarifying. Uh, how many people here have actually programmed in ADA? S respectable. <laughs> um, so not for all people here, everything will be completely new then, but uh, there are probably some people here who are definitely interested in learning more details about ADA. So I guess we'll just start. First of all, I mean, who the hell am I to tell you that ADA is wonderful? Uh, well, that's me. Uh, raised by computers, true. I mean, I grew up on a farm, so yet you, you had animals and far, uh, computers there, so and books. So that's pretty much what I grew up with. Uh, I taught myself to program starting as a child. Basically, like uh, well, my second language I learned was QBasic, <laughs> on, under DOS. So uh, that happened. Um, during the 90s, I kind of just played around with lots of languages, and eventually, well. C++ was this thing I'd heard about, which was like this, this major professional language. I mean, I played around with Java when it was new and nobody cared about it, but it's all those problems about everything. Uh, Fizzle Basic 5, played around with that a bit. It was, I mean, Fizzle Basic, come on. Um, PHP, JavaScript, before it was cool, and then it's, it's still not cool. And yeah, C++, like, I mean, I've been playing around with scripting languages and you're like, I want to do desktop programming, server programming and all the cool stuff, what other cool kids do, not just this bit of website, HTML, CSS, you know, before CSS became useful. C++, it's like I read about it, it was like I'm going to learn it and I went to the bookstore and they got two books on it. The first one was like C++ in 10 minutes or something, one of those books. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lie. It's more like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the second book I got was um, the C++ programming language by Björn Stolstrup. I hope I pronounced that somewhat correctly. <laughs> and my apologies. And that book pretty much taught me everything I really need to know about programming. Because uh, Bjorn, like, it's a style guide, it's a reference for C++, it's a tutorial, it's everything for C++ in one. And it's still C++ uh, 98. So it's old stuff, I mean, everything here, you hear at the conference, all about the cool stuff, C++ 11 is already this old fashioned thing. Mm -hmm. I learned C++ 98 and I was happy with it. So, <laughs> oh yeah, they published a few books. So two about, uh, two about C++ even. So first book doesn't really count was something about uh, game development on Android. Nobody cares about game development on Android. You write in Unity and you just publish on all platforms now. Uh, second book was on um, C++ multi-threading. But this is an interesting subject, especially because you got so many frameworks and interfaces, you know, p-threads. Who doesn't love p-threads? It's good fun with that. And of course, C++ 11, threads, and uh, all this stuff. Really interesting time. Then the last book which was published this year is about embedded C++. I don't know how many people here have, have uh, ever thought about doing embedded development with C++. Hence, okay, that's pretty much what my research also showed me. Like, because there is at this point, uh, at least at the moment of publication, there was one other book currently in print on Amazon about embedded C++. So there are now two books on embedded C++ in print. So there you go. That's my contribution to the C++ community and uh, learned a lot. Um, let's do a disclaimer because like I said, it's not an other tutorial. I'm not here to tell you how to write other code. I'm more to tell you about why it's a cool language and why I think that you may want to actually try it because I like it and well, my opinion isn't law yet. It's, it will be soon maybe, but <laughs> right now, I just want to show you the wonders. I mean, just like kittens, but I love kittens. I didn't harm any kittens, <laughs> but 
Ah, it's like kittens. I mean, they've got those tiny little claws and they grow up and it gets sharper and they start hurting you, but they're still fluffy and cute. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's kind of symbolic for Ada. So, um, yeah, going back to when me just meeting C++, it's just like, this the first time like a real language because Java was nothing. I mean, Java was, you have to install this runtime and there's, I don't know, JavaScript just runs in browsers, PHP, cool if you write websites which run faster than CGI scripts, I guess. That's about it. And like, you can use it for everything. Like I said, embedded is what I started doing with it more recently, even just um, abusing the Arduino um, core as little bits to rewrite it to be a pure C++ framework for embedded development. So stuff like that, but you can do it C++ is, was the first thing that does everything. Um, you, can, you can even write servlets in it. I wrote a servlet implementation, I called it servlet, but with a C and an F. So it's almost the same thing. Surface, embedded, desktop, mobile, C++ does everything. So it's just this one language you learn and then you can stop learning languages. <laughs> That's kind of what the corner I was in. So. Really just awesome language, loved it to bits. Um, first compiler was Borland back in the 90s, like late 90s. Uh, there weren't many free or good tool chains for Windows. So Borland released a free command line only compiler tool chain and was like, I'm going to try it with that. And then at some point, I guess, Visual Studio became an option with the free version and yet uh, GCC became actually usable and functional and available on Windows. It was really useful. So 2000 was still a rough time for C++. Just getting started. Yeah, this, it's not just that you can run C++ on, on everything. It's also that the multi-paradigm um, uh, properties of it that's like you, you want to write it like it's C. I mean, sometimes I think I'm kind of a lost C developer in terms of how I write C++. I like the low level stuff. I don't mind pointers. I mean, they're my friends. They don't hurt me much. And you can go high, you can look low, especially since C++ 11, you've got more high level interfaces. And it's just, there's this, it's, it's warm language, but it's also this big grizzly bear. It's, I mean, the debugging tools you have, I mean, Fallgrind is my bestest friend ever. I mean, without Fallgrind, I would not be able to do my job. <laughs> or I would be, but I would have to paid uh, for many more hours because some multi-trading bugs and issues you can find in C++ code or C code or anything around there, it's not fun but you can pick your own safety level. That's it's definitely, uh, because many of the, most, of, most of the criticism levered against uh, C++ is about, um, well, it's unsafe, you, have, you use pointers, raw pointers, and you get always tech overflows and whatnot. I mean, I've heard some from those people who like the weird red stuff. They complain a lot about that. But it's not true. I mean, since C++ 98, you can actually already use um, reference counting and just don't touch the heap directly. You can do it. So it's okay, but uh, like there are some parts about um, C++ where you like, this is like using C back in the 1970s. I wasn't alive back then, but if I had been alive back in the 70s, I would, would be thinking in the 90s with C++, this is like using C back then because it's you can see it's there is a lot of stuff that is back in the 70s it was cool and acceptable and we still have it i mean why a preprocessor it's its own macro language meta language which it just massages all of those uh those bits and parts it's messy i mean there's a reason why uh, bjorn strosrup recommends to never ever ever touch macros unless forced at gunpoint and then maybe even refuse it <laughs> merging header files into, into source files. That's, <laughs> seriously, Wu here hasn't had trouble with just figuring out the right linking order for header files in a source file. That you're just like, okay, now it doesn't compile, it get weird errors. You shuffle a few header files around and suddenly it's like, it works. That's, 
it, it makes me really sad sometimes just figuring that out and it should not be necessary and linking i mean at the point where you have those uh those really nice uh files all compiled and the compiler is like all happy with it and you get the, and the linker is like yo i will just put it together and then you figure out that right it has the symbols there and there but they have to be uh, linked in this order because if it's it's there and it has not seen the, uh, the symbols which are over there. It's like, yeah, they know that and they get, you get the linker error. The whole syntax you get with um, C++ and C uh, toolchain linkers is just amazing. You know, with the whole uh, link static, link, uh, link whole, there are so many options. A couple of projects really taught me a lot of those flags I never knew about and they're really useful and it works in the end, but you feel so unclean at the end. Like it should, what it should be just this nice little make file with, a, with one, one sentence, just throw it in their sources, there, in there, of object files, throw it into the linker and it compiles and it links and it's done. Now you have this whole argument that has to go into the linker of like a whole paragraph. <laughs> so. That's not my favorite kind of hobby. So, um, the syntax. I mean, C syntax, I mean, there's a reason why C style uh, syntax is really popular, because it's easy to read. Okay, some may argue that it's not, but they are usually Visual Basic fans or worse. But once you start adding templates to it, it gets a bit more convoluted. Uh, convoluted. Still readable. Just don't try to debug it too much, especially uh, back then and without actually having GDB with a nice Python script that make a SCD map into something that's actually readable. <laughs> so, it gets a bit, a bit tricky there. And when you start adding more symbols to it, and like, I mean, my absolute favorite is like having const, you know, like having the const function, const, what does it actually mean? What does it do? You can read up on it. There are many Stack Overflow posts where lots of people are totally confused about what certain keywords do because you get lots of keywords. And like for a newcomer, you're like, oh, there are all these keywords. I'm not using those. I'm staying away from them. I'm using this, this part I understand because I'm comfortable with that. And only if you really want to invest the time and effort into it, then you can learn how it works and then you forget it and you have to look it up again the next day because it's not intuitive. <coughs> or maybe I've got bad memory, I mean, never know. And yeah, this is something which is maybe perhaps personal. I mean, STL headers like SSD string, that's that's pretty much my pet peeve with C++ because there's all like all the new headers being added and it's all like shiny and new and but what about adding a few nice methods to the poor old string to make certain operations uh, easier. Like, I mean, if you look at Python, for example, its string functionality is pretty amazing. It does stuff built in. And also the, uh, the, the file interfaces. I mean, I know you've got um, the file system in, uh, in 17 got added. The uh, C++ 17 standard got uh, the file system added, which is kind of already usable. I've used it, but it's still a bit of a pain to actually really use it. And uh, you have to re use the newer compilers. Otherwise, it's still in the experimental namespace and things like that, which is not fun. So it's it's messy. And so I, I feel that at least the low-level part and the, the foundation, the, uh, the really the workhorses like the uh, simple string are being neglected. I don't like that. And uh, well, don't get me started about Boost because, I mean, okay, how many people here actually like using Boost in projects? Using Boost. Using. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's, that's pretty much, uh, I mean, anyone who has started to use ACO and is like at um, like how many namespaces, nested namespaces deep before you actually hit uh, like something like IPv4? You have to go to every, s I mean, I'm not against namespaces, but the abuse namespaces get in many boost libraries. That's insane. And this whole thing about use one header only library of boost and suddenly you're pulling in like 90% of boost. 
I'm also not into that. And that Boost is the only source of future C++ features that also makes me a bit nervous, I guess. Because, I mean, the networking interface will be this ACO I have experience with. And <sighs> I'm not looking forward to it. I mean, I hope they make some improvements. I'm hoping it's not at least the namespaces get a bit fixed, because that was not fun. I hope to clean up the interface at least, but it makes me a bit like, why? I don't get it. So, okay, what do I really want from a language? Because, I mean, I've been whining about C++ now, and uh, this I've not felt any rotten fruit hit in me yet, so that's good. Not offended anyone, I hope. <laughs> My expectation in language is just well designed, which is pretty broad, but it's at least that it's this coherent design that you really feel like there have been some people, some experts have been looking at it, they've built some design requirements, they've put something to get, get together, what you feel, this fits together, this is really meant to be this thing, and it's not something that was just uh, drawn up on the back of a napkin, a used napkin, and then someone took it and played around with it. But it's, it's actually, it should be designed and the syntax clear and readable. So, so just you look at it, you can just read it as though it's, it's like English. It's not always, not all books are easy to read in English, but in general, yes. And of course, easy to build and debug, which is kind of comes back on my issues with actually making more complicated projects with lots of libraries linking with C++. It's going to be this absolute nightmare. And even, I mean, using um, just <laughs> looking at the symbols inside, uh, inside archive files and object files to figure out which one is actually there and whether it actually got exported. Yeah, I don't want that. And of course, I mean, it's less points, but it's also important, efficient and safe. Like the one thing I really like is that the language makes it clear when something is going to be not efficient and not safe. That you're like, okay, you can go there, but here be dragons. You get this bit of hint. So I've been doing some VHDL on the site. Not sure how many people actually do FPGA development here, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I did some VSDL. I also like hardware, <laughs> and that kind of was like some just read that oh it's, it's VSDL syntax that is derived from the Ada syntax. The uh, Department of Defense in the United States they were like we must have uh, VSDL and just base it on this language we already uh, use a lot. So. I learned about Ada and read up on it, and it was like, doesn't hurt to talk with that person, right? So, or language. <laughs> so, reading about what Ada does, what the differences are, just the whole summary about yeah, memory safety, just how it actually treats things like pointers, because there are you can use uh, safe pointers in C++, but it's still kind of cumbersome, and it's it still feels a bit like, yeah, you still have to do a lot of work. Concise, I mean, Ada, one of the design goals was just like, you must have as few different concepts in a language as possible to make it easy to use and, uh, and understand. So that fits well. And a module system, because in Ada, you got packages. Like, and you've got, um, <laughs> you got a specification which just says, okay, this package is that. And that's just done, and it gets. Uh, you don't even need the whole, uh, the, the rest of the of the packets. It's there. The compiler does only needs it way at the end, because the specification contains all of the information you need, and it just gets used compared with the actual usage in the the source is compiling. So it's it is doesn't have a preprocessor which just just merges uh, text like whatever. It doesn't care in which order you throw something in there because it's like it's all there. I just built up this table. I look at it. I've got everything, and but there's no include order because you don't. You're not including. You're just telling the compiler, "Hey, here's the stuff I want you to compile into object files. Go ahead." And a strong typing. That's. I mean, it's not something which you which I really thought about with C++ because, I mean, C is not really strongly typed, at least until C11. 
Um, C++ has relatively strong typing, as in it will at least yell at you often about, a, the, at least or at least warn you, hey, that's probably not a good idea. Like comparing unsigned and signed integers, which you get all the time, and you just ignore it because, hey, it will never go wrong. So I was interested. Then, of course, you're like, okay, you look back on your current relationship with the other language which you thought you would uh, share the rest of your life with, and you're like, this gets complicated because I might just going to write everything in Ada from now on, and we're just going to be one of those Ada ev evangelists, just everything is Ada, I just delete all C++ code after I convert everything, and no, it was, that's a bit too much. So I think it's just, how can I actually use it to, like, they both have their strengths, have their weaknesses, like C++, I mean, I've been programming with it since 2000, so, that's a long time. You get to know the language and I'm not scared of it. It's not, I've got no reason to stop using C++, let's put it that way. It's, I, st I still love C++. I just guess it's, yeah, I still care about it. But it opens, opens a new thing. So what do you then do? It's like when you start a new project, how do you choose which language you're going to use? Well. Right now I've decided that for hobby projects, I would just use both. Like I write it usually first in C++ because I am most familiar with that. I get it working, then I port it to, uh, to ADA. And I try to get it working just as well. And that's kind of my learning experience. That I, that's how I just can directly contrast, okay, those concepts with, I mean, I'm a, I'm a pretty low level uh, developer. That's why I wrote a book about <laughs> embedded C++. So, Low-level stuff in C++ doesn't scare me. Low-level stuff in ADA is what interests me. And so that's why the projects I wrote, which are pretty low-level, uh, SART. That's actually one I've got uh, to show a bit more of. That's actually this, um, this, this uh, project here. So it's on my GitHub. Yes, I've got a nice uh, Windows 98 theme on there. <laughs> it's, it's free, you can also use it. <laughs> I just like it, it's more readable. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a comment line argument parser, which you would also think that, hey, aren't there already like 50 million comment line argument parsers out there for C++? Yes and no. I mean, there is none in the, in the language itself, in the STL, there is nothing like that. I mean, unless you call uh, argv, argc a comment line argument parser, which it <laughs> technically is, but it's more the operating system doing hard work for you. So, and I looked at a few options and it was like, you just got this massive, this, this convoluted like 8,000 lines of templated code and what the hell is it even doing and the, that it will implement its own DSL and cool and stuff. But I just want something that just checks these options I configured in my app and compares it with what comes in via argc, argv. So I wrote something that's uh, 136 lines of uh, C++ code. I mean, if I was really proud of it, so I did the C log thing. Like, yeah, that's showing off. That's just pretty simple to use. And it supports all the flag types, short option, long option, and uh, value string. There's probably more stuff that you could add to it, but that's just feel free to open a, a ticket <laughs> on my GitHub. Uh, other version is just, uh, well, it's not. 100% port yet because I just have it as a single uh, package. You cannot have instances of it. But how many times do you need more than one comment line argument parser in the application? So I thought it was an uh, acceptable compromise. To just have it slightly simplified. You can see the, um, it's the test application. And it's, if you just look at this and you look then at uh, the, um, the C++ version, it's not that different, I mean, in terms of general look. But the interesting thing is when I actually start looking at uh, the code for it. This is the, the other specification. So the header file for people uh, who need a little bit of help. <laughs> and you can see lots of things which may or may not make sense. So the, um, I mean, Defining your own type. A record is a struct. 
So for example, it's uh, lots of stuff, stuff maps pretty much directly. Then I've got here the, uh, this is the header file for the C++ version, which is maybe slightly easier to recognize. It's the same, uh, same functions, same methods, as you say, class methods. But it's, yeah, it is a bit less stuff. That's where you see that uh, already with, with ADA, is that, for example, in functions, you really have, the, uh, have to specify the, uh, it's kind of like objective C for those who know that. You actually uh, specify first the name of the argument, and then you have to specify the, the type, and you specify the direction. Like you can have it as an, as an input, uh, or it, uh, as out, or you can have it as in out. So you specify what it does. And interesting note there is also that uh, you don't get to use, um, so you don't get, get to decide whether it's the, the value you're trying to pass is too large for registers or the, the stack. The compiler decides. It looks at it, it knows, the runtime knows. It does it all for you. So you don't have to worry about that, it will be fine. So you will not blow up the stack because it, it, it will not allow you to bl blow up the stack. So there will be no stack overflow for ADA. Uh. What's the difference between procedure and function? Um, a, a procedure has no return value. That's a strict distinction in ADA is that um, when you, a uh, procedure is something that does something, but it doesn't return anything. It's like, it's like a void function or a void method, class method in C++. So we have this uh, strict distinction. Uh, if you ever have a function, then you get something like this, where um, we have to specify what it, what it returns. Is there like a basic, I think, was kind of like that distinction between functions and procedures? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually something that, uh, I mean, uh, that comes from, it was uh, the first standardized in 83. So it's, it's lots of uh, things like that from back then. I mean, like this with C++ officially, uh, it's a class method or class, yeah, it's, it's a class method officially, what you call it, I believe. And there are those real distinctions, nobody really cares about it, whether you call it uh, a function or a procedure or a method, it all gets used interchangeably, but there is a difference. And in ADA, you've got this difference between a function and a procedure. So you look at the front and you immediately know, oh, it's going to return something or not. Hard to, re hard to guarantee there. So that's... Uh, What's the deal with this unbounded string? Is that, uh, can there be different kinds of strings? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> the, the thing about ADA is that um, the type system in ADA is so that um, you don't get any predefined types. Like, I mean, you don't, I mean, in, there are some integers uh, predefined for your own pleasure in the, the standard library, the ADA library. But normally you just specify an integer as just like a range. Like I want this to go from zero to whatever or minus something to whatever. Strings are similar. Most strings are just, uh, are actually just limited in size. So you specify I want this string to be this, this large, except when you use an unbound string. That is one exception. If you don't know how large it's going to be, then you can use an unbound string. And I just cheap it out, I guess, because, uh, I mean, it's um, absolute. I think if you were to do a any kind of code review with real added developers, which I am not yet, they would look at something like this, and it would be like, you could change that. There's going to be a bound string. You're going to, do, to figure out how much you need there, what the limit is, and you're going to set this hard limit, and that's it. Because then you're not, never going to run out of memory for one. Get flag actually with a uh, record. It's one. Get flag. It's an out parameter. Do you need an out parameter? Is it? It's already in uh, there covered in arc value. It's in the outbound string. It just returns uh, whether it actually has, uh, has has found the flag. So if it doesn't find the flag, uh, this will not be changed. It's similar to a reference in uh, C++. Because if it was C++, I would say, oh, we should return like optional string, for example. That's yeah, that's, that's a matter of taste. I mean, in C++, I'm, uh, I get do the same thing in the C++ version. I actually, uh, you, people are probably going to hate me for that, but uh, I return a bool. I just return a bool because 
Comi is C developer, but I'm just used to the, this. The return value is like, did it work? Did it not work? And the value is then passed by reference. That's uh, something I've. Also, nice thing is you can return multiple values that way and things like that, and it's less complicated. I'm not sure it's more efficient, but uh, it would be interesting to benchmark that maybe. So that's. Um, I've not done a lot of any initialized variables before calling that way. <laughs> that's why we have suit option now. Uh huh. It's not the production code, that's my <laughs> excuse there. <laughs> I really had uh, someone uh, fix a bug in, uh, in the code. Or at least if I uh, would like an issue with one, one type of um, command line argument which was not going to work with it and it got fixed. So it's a bit better, but I haven't had time yet to fully test it and break it, which is the fun part. And that's also why I'm really interested in actually taking the, uh, the C++ code and seeing how easy to break it is compared to the ADA version. It's I'm definitely interested in that. So if I look at the, um, the actual, I'm not look, looking at headers and specifications, but yeah, I mean, just a quick glance at like, this is normal syntax. I like commenting. I really like commenting. It's, it just makes me happy. So um, that's the uh, brief scroll through the C++ version. And then you look at the, at the body of the other version. Just to give a quick impression. So, same comments. <laughs> this is nice uh, healthy typing. You can see there are no curly brackets anywhere because it's, uh, I think some of the Pascal and Fortran developers here may feel a tint of nostalgia there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's similar to that. It's, just, it's meant to be just readable. You don't have any symbols. It's just all like, you just read something just like when you start a loop. It's just for and something you loop. And also important is that uh, when you actually end something, you say here and loop explicitly. You don't have any dangling uh, end, like just like closing curly brackets. What did you close? What does end there? Nobody knows. And this way the compiler can actually check like, oh, you did actually close it, or you forgot to closing statements somewhere else uh, before that. So just like uh, your function or uh, procedure also ends like that. Just you have to actually specify the name of it. So it adds context which the compiler can use to actually validate that you are not just uh, forgetting something because humans forget stuff. And this is the kind of stuff that the compiler can just look at and be like, um, you forgot that. So yeah, that's a uh, sort. Nymph RPC is a uh, remote procedure call library which I wrote in C++. I haven't ported it yet. That's a lot of networking stuff and multi-threading. Multi-threading is integrated into ADA since uh, 1983. <laughs> So you got all the current stuff is already there natively in ADA. Uh, it's an in integral part of the language. So there is no like before C++ 11 or something, you could not do that or you had to use p threads or whatever. You use ADA, you can use concurrency. It's, it's just there. So that's what I'm looking forward to porting that. And well, I mean, I'm currently freelancing and I work jobs and they're always clients. They come to you or your boss comes to you and has like here, this stack of requirement is like, it must be written in that language. I've even written in stuff in uh, JavaScript a few years, which is not fun, <laughs> but you learn from it. So use whatever is required. I mean, try to coerce the client to use something more sensible, but if, that, if everything fails, then there you go. That's what you use. And for my own projects, best of both worlds, just use both and learn from it and maybe improve the C++ standards. <laughs> that would be nice, turn C++ into ADA. Oh. <laughs> and talking about learning ADA, because there's always this uh, C++ uh, ADA, <laughs> it's a massively complicated language, you're never going to learn it, it's, it's only people with like 20 years of industry experience have some idea of what it actually can do and can actually really use it. But it doesn't really jive with this whole concept behind ADA of just having a few concepts and a simple and concise um, syntax as possible. So 
the second point, the core concepts, they, they are not really hard, they're just different. I mean, it's a different syntax. If you're used to a C++ style syntax, then you look at the ADA and you're like, well, am I looking at uh, Fortran now? Uh, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's, for me, it was transitioning from C++ to ADA. Um, I love modules. Just the first time, just writing the make file. Yes, I'm one of those make file people write it by hand in Notepad++ or FIM. <laughs> writing the make file for compiling my first ADA program and just netmake doing the whole thing for me and just realizing just how simple this is going to be. You just provide it, you don't have to worry about include order and things like that. And I love modules. I mean, I totally get for C++20 is likely going to have some modules support in there. I mean, it's only like 39, 40 years after ADA, but congratulations. There are some improvements, I guess. But no preprocessor as well. It's just, you just have the language, you don't have two languages or three languages in the case of adding uh, templates, uh, templates as well. So okay, you have to reference the right syntax every five seconds. But that's why you've got references for, and when it works, it's just uh, you don't have weird crashes and stuff like that. Um, even though I do some pretty dirty stuff in the uh, in actually the parsing with using two data structures side by side, and actually having one is just a reference uh, to values in the other. You know, useful stuff that works uh, just fine in R. Uh, fewer problems with that than in my C++ version. This when I first implemented a so concept like that. So points go to ADA there. And <laughs> I really just like it. It's the feeling you get. It's not this uh, dirty, disgusted feeling, you know, after you've done something in C++ and you like, especially some linking routines and feeling like, okay, it works now, but I don't feel, <laughs> feel okay with that. It's pretty much, I think that's a summary of my professional C++ career at this point. <laughs> uh, cool stuff there, but also lots of moments where like, C++ is also patient, but more in the, uh, like just, just do something, write code kind of, uh, kind of version, or depending on which communities you're in, like someone is like, hey, there's this new version in the new standard, which absolutely you should use, and you should not learn to, new, to use the old stuff. Gosh, you have to use the new stuff. There's only the new stuff. You will never be stuck with, uh, with GCC 4.2.2. I was stuck with GCC 4.2.2 with the uh, Dinkumware standard library without C++ 11 support or anything resembling it. Thank you, Kieran X. Um, learning the old concept in C++ is totally valid, but it's just this whole tug of war between old and new and yeah, okay, that's more the uh, <laughs> disgruntled with C++ uh, version, but with ADA, you just have to read the documentation, I guess. That's, so read the documentation, stay disciplined, not just skip through it, don't just copy code from Stack Overflow. I mean, there will not be a lot of ADA code on Stack Overflow anyway, <laughs> but that's beside the point. Uh, found a lot of people in uh, Freenode IRC in the ADA channel who are really cool people and they help me out with lots of stuff. You can ask them questions, they are really patient, just like ADA. They're just, they love to explain because someone is using their language. <laughs> <laughs> so, great community, really just, just love it. And the compiler as well, because everything is so explicit, you just, if the compiler says it's wrong, it's wrong. And you made a, made a mistake. Except for this one thing was probably a bug in uh, with the referencing. But that might still have been my fault, I'm not sure. So they said it was not my fault. But so I also like the, the source code. It ends up looking clean because you're not adding lots of symbols and where it's uh, things in brackets everywhere. It's just like you're writing a sentence with some numbers in there. So it's, it's easier to read. And I, this is like similar to VHDL. I mean, I'm not sure how many people actually have programmed in VHDL. Okay, very lock. Good. Oh, 
The difference uh, between looking at um, open source Verilog code and the difference between looking at open source VHDL code. That's kind of like uh, what you see with, with ADA and C++ as well, because lots of C and C++ code is, I mean, everybody uses their own formatting and it ends up being like, yeah, okay. Hard to read, lots of things everywhere. And with ADA, you have fewer options to just write whatever and the formatting stays roughly the same. So, because one thing which I didn't point out in the code earlier, but uh, ADA is kind of similar to the old style C that you have to declare all the variables at the beginning of a procedure or function. So everything stays nice in one place. You don't just mix stuff. And that's really helps with readability. So, and because you have, you have so few different concepts, that's why you always know why it works. It's not just that you're like, well, I mean, uh, like this week I was playing around with some uh, libvlc code and I just tried to compile the sample and it was like, yeah, there some win main issue, couldn't find a symbol, blah, blah. Okay, well, how does it work? Why is, is it trying to search for that? And it was something about somewhere else is, is also finding that and the solution is undev main <laughs> works. So if dev main, undev main, everything is fine again. And that's, that's as far as I got on that issue. And that is a commonly used C library. So I could research it. I could figure out why it's doing the thing, but not worth it. And so, you, and with Ada, it's, it doesn't have that problem as much. And super strong typing. That's actually uh, with the earlier talk about uh, concepts in C++20, kind of reminded me of that. Because one thing Ada has is that you cannot, like if you do type is, uh, type my int is integer, then you say my int is, is the type integer, it's just type def essentially. Then you cannot assign later a variable of type my int to a variable of type integer or vice versa, because there are different types. I mean, obviously you type deft it, so it's a different type. So you, you can, but, uh, you say you have a string you define a nice little string, unbound the string or bound the string, and you say, I make a uh, type ISBN out of it or a street name or whatever. You can never ever just assign it to a random string variable or vice versa. It's always going to be that type. It's going to be a street name. It's going to be an ISBN number in string format and nothing else ever. So y there is no confusion. It's always that's going to be that type. So. That's a really the explicit type. There is nothing uh, implicit in ADA. It's not going to cast anything for you. It's not going to convert anything for you. You're a big developer. You can do it yourself. You know what you're doing. If, if, I, if I've typed my string is string, for example, how do I print that? <coughs> because it's presumably print, print takes a string. Mm -hmm. so what's you, the abstraction I I just have a, uh, just a simple cast would suffice there. You would have to uh, tell the, uh, so basically it looks like a C type cast, you could say. And you just tell it, hey, I know it's this, uh, it's actually defines this type, but I know internally it's that type, and then you can just use it as a normal string. But you have to explicitly cast it, or at least uh, instruct the compiler that you know what you're doing. You know that it's not that type, so. Can you instruct it to do nonsense with the cast? I mean, complete nonsense? I'm pretty sure if we yell at that, we'd have to look at. Uh, so we'll let you break its arms if you. Um, well, I mean, if if it's uh, if it's actually a string inside, then it would let you do it. But if it's incompatible, it will still yell at you, because it's uh, like you're just saying, okay, it's compatible, but it's a different type. That's also the the distinction there. So. Um, some may have noticed that the, the ADA code for SARTs, the port is slightly more verbose than the C++. It's a um, couple dozen more lines in it of code. I think 176 instead of 136. Pff, big deal. <laughs> but it's uh, just more typing up front to save time later because you're really explicit with uh, just indicating what you're doing and why you're doing it and it should be easy to read. So that's just for readability. The uh, runtime safety level, because ADA comes 
pre-equipped with a runtime, which is configurable, right? which can actually uh, catch things like uh, buffer overruns and all the, the, the things. Just if you do something funny with the unbounded string and you have that enabled in the runtime, it's enabled by default, I believe, then it will just throw an exception. And unlike with C++ exceptions, ADA exceptions are lightweight. I mean, they've been used uh, since uh, the 1980s, so running on those uh, military hardware since uh, it was an integral feature. So um, they're lightweight, they're an essential part of the, uh, of the runtime. And you can catch pretty much anything that happens aside from the hardware catching on fire, which you can still catch, but you can do anything about that. So, so there are multiple safety levels there. We'd have to look up which ones, but it's basically like uh, memory, just also with, um, you don't get heap corruption because you don't get to touch the heap or the free storage because it's actually uh, an ADA has this uh, default storage pool, which you can uh, create access types for, which is uh, also used. And so you can also create your own, um, own storage pools with different, for different access types, given different uh, access levels. And so basically segment the heap in different sections, but you will never uh, touch it directly. You don't have raw pointers the runtime will actually handle it for you, so the access to, to the heap. So there's always like, you can also uh, specify the access level, specify whether it's read, uh, read, write or read only, things like that. So there are quite a few options there. And uh, some may have heard of uh, Spark, the Spark Ada dialect, which is um, the extra safe feature, uh, of, uh, so say version of Ada. This is actually what, what is used for programming things like the Ariana 4 and 5 rockets and Avionix and things like that, which is even more strict. Spark uh, was the added contract, so uh, contract-based programming, among other things. Which is uh, since contract-based programming is part of ADA 2012 now. So Spark is becoming, it's basically like what ADA is going to become apparently. So contract-based programming is a thing which is really nice for safety because you know exactly what's coming to come back from, uh, from a function. There are no surprises because surprise a bit. Contract-based programming helps with uh, things like static analysis just to prevent uh, things from going wrong before they happen. The, if you really want to know everything about ADA, uh, the working group that actually worked on, on defining the requirements for ADA, which actually disqualified every single language uh, that existed back in the 1970s, early 80s. The Steelman language requirements document is the one which <laughs> actually compiled for the Department of Defense in, back in 1978. Um, URL is there. The working group consisted out of experts from all around the world. So including Dijkstra, you may have heard that name sometimes. And it, Everybody got consulted, essentially. This in, uh, national, international experts, and they all just worked together on that one document <coughs> and used that as the perfect language to replace the hundreds of domain-specific languages which the Department of Defense uh, was using at the time for embedded projects. So it was a pretty big thing to live up to. Like you have this 450 languages or more they had back then, and you want to have this one language that's binds them all and that's they made their own language they just outsourced it to four different uh, companies they contracted them say hey make this awesome language using this 100 plus documents uh, uh, set of requirements and they went to work at the uh, two of the uh, contractors got eliminated halfway through just okay not good enough next two continued the ends <coughs> are the resulted they kind of merged both sides and they named it ADA, what came out of that. So I think it was the green team that actually won. So it's uh, not a hobby project, it's not a hobby language. It's, I mean, I, I really like C++, but I also have to admit that it was basically him back in the late 70s, just hacking classes on top of um, C. It's, it's, not, it's not that. So I have to admit that there is a bit of a slight uh, difference in terms of scope there and when the language was designed and that explains a lot. And you can't, can't forget that, of course. I mean, the Ariana 5 rocket on the left, 
the F-15 um, jet fighter, the Elrond Ada. So, I mean, you don't easily get into those programs. You don't become just become a developer on those programs because uh, security clearance and all that. Why? <coughs> Why do they run Ada? Because of uh, the extreme uh, safety requirements. I mean, the the, co the contract contract-based programming, the, uh, the the runtime uh, safety levels, and so. Because the whole language was designed from the ground up to be as safe as possible. That uh, no matter which fault occurs, you can catch it, you can handle it. Okay, aside from the, the rocket exploding or something, I mean, that's a shame. But, but because you, uh, before you even compile it, the first time you compile it, you can already uh, catch like 75, 90% of all common uh, mistakes which developers make. Like, oh, I forgot to close that one curly bracket there. And uh, well, the compiler still accepted it and it still went into production somehow. And there it exploded, literally. That's something which Ada is designed to, uh, to prevent. And which other languages haven't really managed to. Uh, yeah, I had a question about uh, memory allocation. Because mm -hmm. I read that when they write uh, C programs for these kind of uh, hardware like that, that you're often not allowed to do any memory allocations mm. because you should never run out of memory. So does Auto have any uh, special facilities to have very tight control over your memory allocation in any way? Well, the, uh, the, the stack is obviously limited. So if you do a uh, lo long enough, uh, if you call enough uh, functions, one after the other, you will blow your stack, but that's what's going to prevent that. <laughs> that's pretty much just a hard error for the operating system to handle, sadly. Um, but the, the heap based, at least, so the, the free storage, that is being handled by the, by the storage pools. So you can actually uh, set the limits, access levels, everything on that. So certain kinds of things can have, you can set several different kinds of limits for different things. Yes. In your which have uh, different access types, and you uh, say, okay, this pointer, just to uh, name it like that, but the access type has these access levels for this uh, storage pool, so this block of memory can be used for this access type with these, uh, these access levels. And with these, uh, so y you can access, uh, you can assign rights, as you would do with the user account or something to those access types, and when you use the access type, you cannot do anything that is not explicitly allowed. So that prevents some a lot of issues. Like you don't get anything like wild pointers or um, yeah, you're just reading into some random uh, random memory or using a null pointer. It doesn't happen. And I mean, you can always run out of resources. That's sadly that's uh, at some. But you would just get. I mean. Celloc and Neum, they will just use to tell you uh, nicely like okay, ex uh, request a night. There's no more memory, so you should theoretically just have something to handle that. I mean, I'm okay. I know 99% of all developers never check whether actually the allocation ever worked. I mean, would check whether new actually succeeded. Anyone? <laughs> we just all assume that there is infinite amounts of memory, but there are ways to handle that. I mean, ev even in C++, you can handle that. Nobody does it, but there are ways. Just that Ada is more explicit about it. So, you make a strong case for it. So why why aren't we using Ada for everything? Uh, I think a large part is just because it uh, it was a language designed by the Department of Defense. It was not not a cool hip uh, language like uh, all the other ones. I mean, Fortran is really strong in the scientific community. It still is. Uh, yeah, Java was this uh, this really big language being promoted by uh, by Sun. It was going to be this next big thing. It was going to completely kill C++ and everything. It would, would run on chips and yeah, like Giselle on, on ARM, which is kind of that. So I think it's mostly an image problem. People see it as this, this uh, thing used for military things. It's this Department of Defense language, and it's scary, and it's big. And when you hear those myths about how it's complicated. Is there any benchmarking in the state of the same problem? The, on the, the SART uh, projects, I haven't benchmarked it yet, but uh, uh, definitely with, uh, with the Nymph RPC library, once I want to get it ported, I will do a lot of benchmarking on that. So I've already benchmarked the C++ version of that a lot to optimize it, and I will, be, uh, I will definitely be benchmarking both to compare that. Because... 
Yeah, that's uh, yeah, because it, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Is so, is that, may as well skip because the uh, the type system has more information, so the optimizer can go handle stuff. That's because there you had more context while you're typing in the code. So it, it knows more things. The, uh, so so the, the compiler, the optimizer, it's, it has more information to work with. And also because you have, uh, you have fewer concepts, uh, programming concepts, so there are fewer edge cases and things like that. It's far simpler to optimize for. So, yep. Um, I also really like the logo they have for ADA. But <laughs> So I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around kind of what category of language uh, auto fits in. Is that is it basically a procedural language that just a more strongly typed C in a way? Or the it's 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 also multi paradigm. It does uh, object oriented. It does uh, it does uh, have procedural procedural. Not really. It's more it's more uh, oriented towards uh, slightly procedural object oriented. And uh, contract-based programming. I think those Do are the most. Function program? Does it have uh, first-class functions? Uh, I would have to look at that. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's no, absolutely. Does that. have access to, to functions, access maps? So yeah. Right. To functions. Yeah. Uh, and you can also uh, provide functions or for subprograms, functions and procedures, uh, to mm -hmm. uh, generic form of programming. Right. Yeah, and also, uh, oh yeah, generic programming, so kind of like templating is also in ADA, so. Uh, how does that look? Is it as verbose as uh, C++ or is it? No, it was actually designed by experts. <laughs> 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 the original C++ templates were based on uh, Say again? Um, the original C++ templates uh, were based on that would not surprise me, actually. It makes a lot of sense. OK, uh, you said that the exceptions in ADA are lightweight. Mm -hmm. Does this mean that they are uh, what we, well, there are proposals to add to C++ with the throw statement? So say again? Uh, you, you said that exceptions in ADA mm -hmm. are uh, lightweight. lightweight. Yes. So you can use them for error handling mm -hmm. for common situations. Uh, does it mean that they are value-based and you have to propagate them manually? Or do they pro propagate automatically? Uh, it was a pretty in depth. I think that um, you see, it's just a single level and that just uh, immediately just handle it, as far as I understand it. But I could be wrong. I something I, th I think I'll be using uh, exceptions more with uh, with the next port of Nymph RPC. Then I can probably answer that question better. <laughs> so, any more questions? Then I think, uh, oh. Does uh, the LD still use uh, ADA? Um, it was a requirement until uh, somewhere halfway through the 90s. They have since dropped that requirement of everything must be ADA. So now uh, some languages are also accepted, like uh, C++, the F35. You know, that's well-running project. Uh, has its firmware written in C++. But this is a subset, of course. Like this one safe, um, certified, validated subset. It's a specific tool chain, probably, uh, it's probably C++ 98, I guess. <laughs> but, so, yeah, it's, uh, it, 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 the popularity of ADA has been dropping, but it's kind of coming back again. And I think it's a cool language, and I would, it's, I would really like to see the community, it's this really nice community for, for ADA, just welcome more people into it, because I really like that community and the language. So. Is, is it still developing? Yes, uh, and the most recent version of ADA was uh, 2012, and the one before that was 2005. So it's uh, they've still got regular updates, and I mean ADA will not go away because, uh, like I showed, I mean Ariana, the Ariana rockets, and Boeing, and Airbus, and I mean every single satellite pretty much in orbit right now, they use ADA, because I mean you're not going to flash the firmware updates uh, on the satellite in orbit, so there you just want to have like with Spark and just pure safety and security and well tested because you're not going to take any chances. You're not going to, I mean, some people have CubeSats up there with Node.js, I believe, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I'm looking forward to it. I have to buy new reference books, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think we're done with questions then. Then uh, thank you very much for being here. <laughs> <laughs>